Okay, so I'm recording here for our November 20th meeting of the dev team. Who's the third person besides Abe and Ruslan? Oh, it's Miles. Miles, hi. Good. Good to see you. So, okay, I'll, I'll do a little bit of uh, update on professional development, kit builds. Um, let's see, Abe got continuing work on D3D Mini, and then Miles on DC to DC converter. Now, um, which which I'm going to ask, what, what does it take to turn that into a power supply for the 3D printer, which goes from 120 AC to, to 12 volts DC? But that's later. So I'll start by updating on latest progress in town here. So um, regarding the 3D print cluster, so you see on the slide number four, that's kind of how it's looking right now, but go to slide three and you see a little homebrew of the next version of the, the extruder with an underslung carriage. So what you see there is what I actually it's currently printing right now. I'm actually printing that out right now. But the idea there is instead of mounting the extruder horizontally, like, uh, well, where the carriage Take a look at uh, slide number four. You see the where the extruder is. It's basically the x-axis has the carriage going vertically up and down. Now, in this design here, you see the carriage is kind of like um, left and right. It's hanging, the, the extruder is hanging down from it. There's a reason for this change. So um, the reason is that we actually have issues on the mounting with the when we're using three millimeter bolts straight through the extruder to the the plastic pieces. The bolts tend to get loose. We're not mounting by the faceplate, like which is the industry standard. So uh, here in this version here, you can see a little triangle back. Let me share my screen here. Um, yeah, so you see the the little triangle here in the back. So this extruder here is mounted to the faceplate of the motor. So the motor is behind hidden. There's a fan, cooling fan, and that, that's the sensor holder here. But that's the carriage piece where the rods, rods are. Uh, but the extruder mount is integrated to the carriage piece. So, the, so if you go to D3D part, part library, not, not really D3D part library, it's actually hidden at... 3D printer extruder. Uh, so if you go to 3D printer extruder, uh, go to the first part, and that is the extruder mount. So it's so it's a modified carriage piece with the whole the mount system for the stepper motor and for the extruder. And it's a very basic kind of a design, but it's hard to print because it's got a lot of overhang. Um, so, but that's what I'm printing right now. Uh, if you go to, I'll just paste that link. So you can t download the file. Uh, so the addition here notably is the integrated carriage with the extruder mount, uh, addition of a print cooling fan. Now we haven't been using a print cooling fan uh, until now, so that's I mean that's a you absolutely need a print cooling fan for higher quality no question about it you can still print without it but you get better overhangs and better cooling because the idea is that when you lay down plastic you will in order for it to do overhangs you have to freeze that plastic like ice in midair uh, otherwise it would droop on you so anytime it goes over any overhang it will tend to droop but if you have a fan print cooling fan and the nozzle is not shown there actually fan nozzle not shown yet, but it, it would go down and point to the to the nozzle of the extruder. Uh, so that's that's what I'm working on here. Um, also, if you look at build one and build two, time lapses of the complete D3D 3D printer build. And uh, so I, I've done one that's in five hours and 16 minutes last week. So that's where we left off last week. I did another one uh, shipped from. So that was shipped by Sarah from California and then Alex from California. Uh, we're basically testing the kit, whether it's buildable, 
and uh, getting further data on, on build time for the 3D printer to get really comfortable with the six hour builds as the, as the norm. And that's what we're teaching our people to do right now uh, because that's the kind of efficiency. If you really understand the printer, it's not an issue to build it in about six hours, but you really have to understand it, understand how it all goes together. So that's my report on the 3D printer. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about OSC clubs because I'm actually taking off to London, Ontario, uh, actually in two days to the, do the first ever three-day immersion training out of which we're, we're starting an OSC club at the London International Academy in London, Ontario, Canada that is. So that's good news and uh, trying to build a team that way as well. But let's talk about, uh, so yeah, let's bring in a couple of other things. So um, Abe, do you want to update us a little bit on, on where you're at? <clears throat> yeah, look at that. Abe, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. Yep. Can hear you now. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I kept, um, you know, working on the the clamp part and the other frame assembly for the the PVC frame mainly, and um, I kept trying to redesign for that, that the bolt situation on the clamp there. But <clears throat> I figured the first step was to try to design something with without that after thinking about it more. You could probably uh, design all kinds of different clamps because I looked around a lot like it for other 3d printed pipe clamps and different yeah. things and there are different options you can do complicated things like living hinges and different yeah. flaps and angles and all kinds of things um, but you know most of those things have bad failure points or uh, they're, they're just more complicated so we get the, the simplest either way if you could add a bolt thing on there somehow on the end, but it would mm -hmm. probably be pretty clumsy because you'd have to have a way to open it up, pry it open and get yeah. it over the pipe and that kind of stuff and then bolt it on. But um, something that just snaps on is kind of the, the simplest thing. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that, it, you know, as long as it's designed right, you know, it might take some tweaking, obviously, mm -hmm. but if it snaps on there tight, you know, it's not going to... Mm -hmm. uh, probably make the, the frame any, uh, you know, make it wiggle more or have yeah. less accuracy no, in the print overall. So that's actually, relative to the yeah, fact yeah. that it's a plastic frame. So <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. I have a comment on that. And that is, um, you know, you, we can also use, uh, like, there's clamp collars. Um, and we can 3D print those as well. But maybe we have this clamp, which which is dedicated for... Um, yeah, double split clamp collar, so you can you can put it on. So say you put this on and it wants to slip down, especially if you know, maybe like in different temperatures or whatever, maybe some extra heavy printing or fast printing. But you can also use a, a clamp collar, um, which would be a double split clamp collar. Let me let me pull it up on a double split clamp collar. So this is, uh, yeah, copy image. So two, two balls. Yeah. yeah, something like that. And we can 3D well, print this or... Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, so, well, I guess, let's see, does the other side have to be a bolt, um, an extra bolt, or could it be a, well, yeah, I looked at a lot of different stuff on 3D printing, which is pretty yeah. interesting. Up, you know, people doing with enough accuracy, you can do living hinges, and uh, some people were printing hinges with pins, but it was printed as a solid piece and so on. If your printer yeah. is is pretty accurate, I, I was kind of surprised that you could do that and have parts printed together that were free. I, I, I'm surprised that that works that well, but um, yeah, there's probably a variety of designs would work yeah it's interesting uh, I, I saw some other clamp styles that had multiple parts and angles most of them were like living hinges or you you clamp uh, yeah you basically have another clamp piece that goes over the other clamp or something yeah well this is what you have there that's that's as simple as it gets 
Uh, let's see, is that file on your log, or did you put that into a... Yeah, it's on the... Uh, uh -huh. It should be updated on the library. It's, yeah. It, it is the, the most recent clamp file. Yeah. Let's open that up. Um, that is what you showed there. Yeah, that is like the simplest. Did you draw that up, or did you pull that off somebody else's design? No, I drew that up in CAD. Actually, I, Pretty good. I kind of came with that first, and then the I, I was hoping mainly that it would be a three D three D printable part as it is in the photo there. Like uh, on, it'll sit on the bed, and like you're saying, you probably need cooling and all that. But something that the shape of it could be adapted where it would not uh, require any supports yeah. and things like that. Yeah, a lot yeah. of times, you have certain angles. You have to have a lot of supports. No, that's that's really good. That's actually quite. Uh, right. Quite a treat. You know, Did you, right. um, you have the inner radius such that it basically it's, holds the three quarter inch pipe? This is a three quarter inch it's pipe. It's the version. shape of three quarter inch pipe. Now, for some reason, it needs to be. One thing I figure might happen is it might be. It could be too tight in some ways. Uh, it might, instead of being a single arc, mm -hmm. it might need to be multiple arcs so that it clamps down tighter. Mm -hmm. So that it's under tension when it's around the pipe. That that yeah. would be the next option. I mean, the, there's no telling how much tweaking would have to be done to get it uh, yeah. tight. And it may have to be printed wider if it needs yeah. more uh, stability and things like that. So. Yeah. I mean, one way to go about this is if you put a little little hole in the side, just put a little set screw, you know? You could use set screws into... Yeah. We can definitely yeah. use a set screw on this device to hold um, to prevent it from slipping as well. I mean, set screws are qu quite accessible parts. Um, so yeah, yeah. What yeah. do you think about so, a set screw? Yeah, set screw would good too. If just out of the a hole, I guess it could be a. Um, I mean, important not to put holes in the PVC, but right. uh, let's see, like a yeah, you could have a like a pointed short wood screw or anything that just kind of scotches on the PVC pretty well. Yeah. Um, yeah. doesn't have to go into it. it just, yeah. Yeah, any type of or screw would add a, uh, uh, a little more friction a friction point. But uh, I guess I should add let's see, another photo. I was been looking at the frame trying to figure out the rod length. Um, let's see, where is that? Um so I think I figured out certain distances to uh, the distances of the parts that the axis is made up of and how this would scale because obviously there's the, the stuff is all for like the three quarter inch PVC and that's probably good enough for yeah. the size of the pipe. Going bigger isn't going to matter, but uh, obviously we want it scalable, the, the frame concept. So I was trying to figure yeah. out what uh, sizes it might go up to and we might have even uh, cuts. I, thinking about the, the PVC frame assembly and everything, and uh, I think I put some notes back in the, the working dock for the, the D3D PVC Mini, uh, and that stuff there, but a lot of the issue is the accuracy of the frame, obviously, regardless of whether it's plastic and how much we can stabilize that. Putting it together, it, everything has to be cut pretty accurate and then assembled accurate, so there's a bunch of stuff related to that to try to get the, the squareness factor I'm sure is the biggest issue with assembling printer frames right so I assume that that affects accuracy a lot so um, trying to figure out what yeah the, it's it's not the yeah, squareness as much as parallel yeah I mean squareness yes parallel the sides want to be parallel so that you can you can do it but, but you can adjust for parallel the parallel is going to be set exactly by the length of your two members so so that's where actual tube members length comes in mm -hmm. yeah so it's partly when you if you're gluing the pvc together uh eventually it, it, just, it that's about mostly marking and laying stuff out and having a good process for that but i'm gonna figure out what um <clears throat> I, I went back and i measured uh a bunch of stuff, including the the distance to like the limit switch where it was on some of the other stuff, because I realized that was the uh, the actual length, the the movement length of the on an axis. Uh, so there's one 
there's gonna be one limit switch on every axis at least, right? So uh, Yeah. And the like frame the that you paste into the working doc is that on the part library page? The what? The frame you the, just pasted into the working doc? Uh, well, that is the frame. Uh, I'm trying to assemble or figure out sizes from the frame that you had posted earlier. I'm, I'm using the, yeah, that file. Oh, is that GitLab or uh, is that on the wiki? Uh, let's see. Some of that, that probably is on, on GitLab at the moment. I, I can add the, uh, I, I probably should add the file. I haven't gotten uh, the sizes right on that yet, but yeah, I should update just what I'm doing on the wiki. Because uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the rod length and uh, I made the thickness of the back of the clamp a half inch. I think as I said before, I left it at that, but the distance obviously um, from the, between the clamp pieces is, is what the x-axis rods have to be so uh, and all, all that of course is related so it's kind of figuring out the, the rod length and and uh, the other distances around the axis parts will determine uh, kind of a formula for figuring out what uh, the other sizes of parts so the frame can be scaled and so on because once you 3D print uh, a certain size of clamp obviously we don't have to make an adjustment on that uh, for other frame sizes or something like that. It's going to have to be some multiple uh, of the size for the rod length in order to work with uh, whatever size of clamp is, is printed. Yeah. Yeah. Looks good on paper. Looks good on... Uh... And uh, in the CAD file. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I was just increasing the rod length to check sizes on that because I think I had 13 inch rods in there and it looks like it's going to have to be closer to 14 inch uh, if it's a half inch distance on the clamp which may not be ideal. I figure it's better to put the odd sizes in like the 3D printed parts so that we have even cuts on things like the rods in the PVC because that's just simpler for people to so humans have to cut all those things yeah okay let's see um yeah i uh see when i was trying to figure out how that uh look at potential printing on the on the parts i found i had to i guess my version of linux is an older oc linux install and i had a version of cura uh and i ended up installing i guess the new what is it, Lulzbot Cura is, is the most recent instructions I found on the wiki where so I'm not sure if, if I don't know if the OSC Linux has, has all the most recent updates for that. Is there a, a no, new software update? Uh, yeah, we have the Lulzbot Cura on there. Uh, that, it is a good version. It doesn't necessarily need updating. It's not the latest because it's from a year and a half ago. But Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my version of Linux was, was actually installed from an older version of OSC Linux, so it had an earlier cure that was not the Will's bot, but I updated that. So, yeah, it, I kind of see how that works. I, I don't have a printer. It's see how to set that up. To It, it shows pretty accurately, I think, how uh, the printing is, but I'm not, I'm not just not very familiar with the interface, but it seems to show what, uh, you know, objects might need uh, support or uh, you know how they might print or not uh, I, I adjusted some of the other part pipe pieces to the parts for the frame because they were apparently the wrong sizes somehow I don't know they got generated differently um, I don't know a free cat or something from pipe work and somehow I get different parts but updated those and I tried to adjust the um, I went ahead and adjusted the STL and so on, uh, especially on the corner, so that it would sit, uh, as you suggested, on the, on the Z-axis to look at how that would print. Uh, I I guess it probably print that okay. It seemed to, in Cura there, it seemed to highlight some areas that it thought were problematic, but I, I assume that depends, as you said, on how, how cooled, uh, how slowly it prints, I guess, and how well it cools as it prints up. But right, yeah. Speed, 
obviously for some of those parts is is not gonna not gonna be as fast but <clears throat> yeah okay that probably seems like something that needs to be noted with um the parts too maybe um uh, yeah it probably needs some documentation on some of these parts for how to print them maybe exactly. although i guess that's a variable thing no that's um, exactly right uh, there's an initialization file you can have for QRL. And then there's production engineering notes. I mean, how do you print it on the side? What, uh, what percent infill? Uh, those are all pieces of data that are required for a successful print. And it depends what printer you have for its characteristics of how it's printing, the materials, and so forth. So yes, that's that's all to be documented. Um, yeah, yeah, I saw some some config files for. Uh, yeah. yeah, I guess there are config files for the D, specifically for the D3D uh, to adapt yeah. uh, Moldbuck. And. Uh, I guess there's files you could export or save the settings for the parts and put that file or text with the uh, with a part maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then it becomes interesting, like you know, for people who work, you know, people who do housing. Um, there's vinyl filament too, PVC filament for 3D printing. You can recycle it. Now the fumes aren't great. Uh, you'd have to have it vented and, and have measures for understanding the safety around that. But um, so it's not for everybody, but it's a doable thing. Uh, it's better than making new PVC in terms of pollution. So recycling is always better, but um, still have to be careful about safety um okay that and that will be definitely interesting something to look into for for actual production of recycling which is a whole frontier that we haven't touched so much but we will we are getting into that with the filament maker so okay um so let's move on to miles miles tell us tell us where you're at uh, so right now I'm working on uh, the DC DC converter module, and uh, yeah, right now I'm just working on the drafts and figuring out a few things about uh, how to switch between the buck and boost modes. And, uh, yeah, there's a summary of it there. On the yeah. Nice. What's um the limit is 60 volts here. How difficult is it to get it to 120? It would be a complete redesign, different chip, like which which would be the different parts? Uh, it's mostly the, the the FETs and the diodes that are limiting that. Uh -huh. So it probably wouldn't be too hard, you just like would have to, it would probably be more expensive, but it shouldn't be just a simple swap up. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. Now, when you talk about the DC to DC converter, what's what was the use case that we were considering for this? Or are you considering? Uh, so, uh, so I was thinking like uh, used computers to power uh, supply available, and so uh, if you use that as the, to get some kind of DC, then you could use this module to make it adjustable and say mm -hmm. like 10 10 volt. Um, increments, and so you could kind of turn just any any constant DC source to an adjustment. Yeah, yeah. Or if we have uh, 24 volt batteries, uh, turn that into like for example in the CD home we've got 24 volt battery system, and and it turns out that 12 volt appliances are very common, but 24 volt appliances like light bulbs aren't so common. So that would be one application there. Now here we can go, uh, it could be either going up or down, right? Step up or step down, right? For the, the current design. Yeah. 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 Um, what are your next steps uh, in this process? Uh, so the next steps are to figure out um, the that PWM uh, controller chip that, I, that I'm using right now is it's designed to do like buck 
or boost, or buck and boost on like two separate circuits. So it's either figuring out, or, uh, I guess it would just be like putting switches to disable one mode or the other, or finding a different chip that does a similar thing, but I don't know, this one was, was the only one that had a really fast switching frequency that I could find. So, yes, it's figuring that out, or possibly lowering the frequency a little bit, and then it won't be able to step step up or step down the voltage by as much, but it might be simpler to improve. Yeah, um, and this is, let's see, the PWM com controller, is that a separate chip? Yeah. Um, where's the Arduino in this system? So the Arduino would control the potentiometer. The, the reason there's a separate chip for doing the, the pulse width modulation is... Uh, the, the Arduino doesn't have, it can't uh, produce a high enough frequency to to uh, step the voltage by a, a reasonable amount with this size of inductor, and so you can use the Arduino to control the potentiometer, which changes the the pulse width modulation. It, it controls the the pulse width modulation controller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, at twenty-five dollars, is that is that about as good as we can get, or or is is there a way to do this more cost efficiently? Since forty-five is not um, a lot, but yeah, I, I'm not. Sure. It it seems like things get a lot cheaper when. Like if you have the economy of scale, so yeah, it's it. Sorry, you're cutting out there. Do we lose you? Oh. Miles, I think we lost you there for a while. We lost him. Okay. Uh, until he comes back, let's see if we can uh, continue. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, Miles, you, you back? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, tell us more about that. So, so yeah, until, until you go bulk buying this stuff, it's, it's a little bit on the expensive side. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but in terms of, uh, of an adjustable power supply yeah. with that much capacity, yeah. it's it's cheaper than, if you use like a used supply as the DC initial part, then it's cheaper than what's on the market. In terms of yeah, no, I think that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, and the controls like, let's see, can you get constant current operation out of this or, or no? Um, it's a different no, thing. It's, it's designed for voltage. I'm not, I'm not sure how how current uh, sources work. Yes. Yeah, for constant voltage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, like, what, say when we turn on, is there like the potentiometer? That's um. Let's see. Is there provision for some kind of a knob to like? How do we control this? Is it just by code, or is there going to be a knob on the Arduino or something to turn it or? Turn the voltage up and down. What's how does this look? Uh, yeah, that, that has yet to be determined. So the the Arduino would control the potentiometer, and then um, it, you would be able to control the whatever the set voltage is on the Arduino with, um, yeah, say like a, a knob or something. Or if you wanted to, you could uh, you could directly control that uh, potentiometer in the diagram, but um, I don't know. There, there isn't necessarily a correlation between um, 
like a certain position and a certain voltage, like it would depend on what your input voltage is, and if your input voltage is changing, then you have to be constantly turning them up. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at output 2. Uh, where's output 2 in a... Let's see, the... Output 2 in a... Gate driver. Is Does that connect to the the main circuit? How does that connect to the main circuit? Uh, the, the high side gate driver? Yeah. Uh, that connects to the, the FET that's... Um, it's kind of the top left one. Top left. And it's, it's, yeah, that that's just there because the because the uh, the drain the drain of that that FET is isn't isn't that ground, and so in order to create the voltage difference between the the gate and the uh, sorry not the drain the source between the gate and the source, um, you need a, a drag bird. Uh huh. Um, and when I see like out two by the high side gate driver here, that's is there a label missing on your in your main circuit diagram? Because I see, for example, out one feeding into the power element in the oh, middle. Yeah, it's, it, it might be a bit confusing because if if um, if it's not an explicit label, then it's probably a label on the IC, like on this rectangle of the IC. So, like, there are some IC uh, connections that just have nothing connected to them, but those are, I guess, I just made them act as labels, but it seems kind of confusing. Like, when you label, for example, out one, that's just a label? It doesn't do that automatically? Oh, yeah, that I have. To, I have to I've added that in manually. Uh -huh. So you, you just missed adding, like, to the top left power element. You didn't uh, label out two there. Or, or no. Um, uh, missing. Tell me what the T, what's TG stand for, the label uh, by the, by the FET? Oh, TG, um, that connects to the, the high side driver. So that would be, so if you look on the high side driver um, symbol, it's, yeah. it should have a TG pin. TG input. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see. All right. Um, is there a way, uh, so when you, when you, Continuing this, can you build this out? Yeah, that's that's the next step. I'm just kind of finalizing the drafts. Yeah. And actually thinking about um, just just making it uh, like cutting the number of switches in half because the the four switch model, which is what this is approaching, is more efficient, but it takes like more work. So it seems like it might be better to just simplify it and build it, and then we can. Iterate on that later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's I'm hoping to um, at least order the parts by sometime in December. And then yeah. Down and then Is. Is there any heat sinks involved in this thing? Like you, you'd have to heat sink it if you're gonna handle decent power, right? Because right now you don't show any fans or anything, or yeah, definitely. This is like the the whole like PCB layout and the mm -hmm. uh, case is actually cool. So let's do. Let's see. If we were to um. How much is that PWM controller chip, for example? Um, it's pretty cheap, like less than five dollars, I think, maybe like three or four dollars. Mm -hmm. But if it's if it's simplified, I might be able to. I don't know. I've been looking just recently into um, like 
how pulse width modulation is done at the more basic level. And it might be possible to just use a, an oscillator or something to make a really simple thing that would just take the Arduino, the, the from the Arduino, and just produce pulse width from that and use the Arduino for all the control. Uh -huh. That seems like maybe simpler, but requires more. Yeah, yeah, okay. That sounds good. I'm curious. I think eliminating the Arduino would be uh, simpler. Because I would think that um, the Arduino is easy for people to program, but if you want to make CNC millable uh, open source, you know, hardware circuits, it seems like using really low headcount ICs is required for that. And just figuring out how to do stuff with like five, five, ti five timers and, and, you know, different man chips. And uh, that takes a lot of circuit board space, I guess, is the problem. I'm not um, familiar with this circuit. It's been a while since I've done electronics. But is that um, feasible? I'm, I'm curious whether the Arduino is always the best solution. It seems like a bunch of the things that that the Arduino is being used for, like thermal monitoring and control or PIDs, uh, could be replaced with hardware. I'm just basing this off of some Hackaday article I think I read uh, the other week ago about uh, just certain hardware uh, debalancing, I think is what it was about, but about doing certain circuits uh, with hardware instead of software. Yeah, different ways to do it. So that, that's a, that's a long discussion on where it's. I, I think you, know, you gotta really take a look at case by case because also you can build your own simple version. Those of Arduino is basically the microcontroller chip in a socket that would allow it to break out and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, definitely. So so yeah, let's see if we can prototype this. See see how this works. Um, for me, I, I would see. Um, let's see and. Uh, the design that we're using exactly as is, like if we could, um, um, could it be an experimental case for, let's see, oh no, this, yeah, increasing this to, to 120 volts, let's say, and then rectifying from 120 AC, so then we can make things like power supplies for the, um, the 3D printer or other devices. So the most interesting thing would be how do, how do we design this in the most modular way so we can put these things together. But yeah, that's 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 a longer discussion now. But yeah, let's let's see what what happens here. So uh, thanks, Miles. Um, do you have any questions or anything? Or um, yeah, I guess what what do you think about about uh, uh, simplifying the design? Like it would take probably a little bit more work since I have one design made, but I, I think it would be easy, easier to implement. Oh, so the, the main simplification would be, <clears throat> what would, would that be? be? Um, removing um, two of this, removing about half, like one of the switches, one of the diodes, and uh, removing that pulse width modulation controller and replacing it with something like I don't know, something else that would have a similar function. But yeah, because that is a lot of a lot of pins there, right? Yeah, you you can do. Yeah, I think I think it's worthwhile using discrete components. Um, the idea there being that just the circuit will be simplified and parts count significantly. Yeah, because uh, just the switching between the bucket and boost is kind of awkward with this with this uh, setup because yeah. you have to change, I think, like five pins on that IC to switch between them. And then the other five pins that were previously disabled would have to be connected. So it's a lot of switches. Yeah, a lot of switches that, uh, let's see, that are controlled by... How, how is that done in practice with the current setup? How do you do the switching? Uh, it hasn't been implemented yet. Right, so, so that's, that's a lot of, a lot of parts there, right? Yeah. I'd say we get away from that. 
So yeah, I would suggest suggest the simplification. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I was just just looking for some input. That's that's good. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue. Moving on. Um, thank you, Miles. Uh, so, Ruslan, do you have any any updates? I will wait until I have uh, something complete. Excellent. Since last time, has ha, have your priorities shifted, or you're continuing on the kind of um. Uh, The same, I do uh, several things in parallel yeah. on occasion. Uh, I bought some missing parts for Herman's deep printer. The, the, the only one thing is missing an uh, adapter for um, electri electricity socket from Australia yeah. to Europe. Yeah. And then I uh, tried to try out the printer. And I started uh, to improve our position and uh, was a piping workbench. Now it, uh, it works much better with the working debugger. Uh, with the help of uh, a forget uh, user, I, I, I was able to set up debugger. And now it's uh, much easier to develop. That's good. That's good. Okay. Keep going. The, the piping workbench, that is quite useful. And I'm kind of leading into more of the 3D printer workbench. That's and, uh, all great work. The, there was some uh, discussion considering uh, the deal of materials integration and free cat. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, check once again the links. If a uh, Fricket uh, user provided me, and um, uh, then we can uh, discuss. Yeah. About yeah. Integration. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's that's useful. Um, we know there's some functionality in Fricket on that, and we haven't really worked a lot with those kinds of workflows. Yeah. So, um, to wrap up, though, I, I do want to just comment briefly about um, OSC clubs and their role. So, so as I mentioned, I'm going to London, Ontario, of uh, this for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday workshop. But how does that? Uh, why why pursue clubs, and how does that look in general? So the intent is that clubs do a quarterly build event like an extreme build event so we design and kind of bring the physical real life regular thing driven by the mentors of the clubs uh, so there's design on a weekly basis and then there's an event every quarter where different clubs get together now right now we don't have many clubs we have one club okay so I don't know who we're gonna be competing against maybe it's against time but uh, uh, the idea was to every quarter do a do an intense build and we're looking at the cordless drill and the power tool construction set as getting that off the ground and I've talked about this for many times already but uh, I think the team in, in Ontario is quite excited about the cordless drill uh, and sp spin that out along with Hero X so we're we're doing the contributions from clubs on one side but then the general public on Hero X which is the crowd design so uh, crowd design platform what are some of the main skills to, to do this? Like if we get many clubs, so Hero X gets the crowd design aspect and it's funded. Like, yeah, so you can involve funders and cl clubs can fundraise, like the mentors asking their local businesses. Or ideally, uh, if we focus on products, then product sales, like can we actually build a, a high quality cordless drill that, that's actually a, a marketable item? You know, so, so there's different ways to fundraise through 3D printing or 
some more standard ways to do that. Now, uh, if, if there are a number of clubs happening all over the world, then that's good news, and then we can implement more of the product ecology uh, approach, the well, collaboration ecology approach, where based on part libraries, so you know, for example, like here on the right hand side, here we have the picture of the D3D PVC frame, we've got modules that we've already used. But the idea is that once people get familiar with the FreeCAD workflow of using part libraries, uh, which are a huge part, then we can we can talk about meaningful design by people who can come into a project and learn pretty rapidly how to work their way around the different OSE designs. So part libraries are absolutely critical. Now, along with part libraries, there's uh, how, do, how do you actually design something? Well, that will be the design guide, so that would be something we can work on. Uh, and then basic tools, so, so FreeCAD, uh, there's video publishing with Caden Live, I mean, there's many different aspects. There's uh, the use of common, common online tools like Google Docs, and then documenting everything on your work logs so that if there's more people joining the team, you can find by what, what each, find what each team is doing, and, and the goal being collaboration. So, so every, every club would would set up its own work log with with its members, and we borrow designs from each other based on common libraries, and we can find everything based on our our work logs, so that there's a basic seamless way to to develop in parallel. Um, now. The relationship to the dev team, so we'll continue the dev team as, <clears throat> as always. And uh, I think one one big thing is, and, and I started working on a book as I mentioned, um, you know, this this spring. But then hitting into the the immersion program, I got pretty much waylaid from that effort into organizing that, and now trying to get get the 3D printing enterprise off the ground. So I've been kind of negligent on the book, but I do really, I mean, I'm going to try to make it a priority to return to that as soon as possible, because I, I do believe that having a big perspective for this work and how do you collaborate and, and the background work behind this kind of nature of open product development, you know, there's a lot to learn, lots, lots of different cultural material there that a lot of people are not familiar with. So, so I am going to work on uh, the book as soon as I get a, get a chance to return to that. And in the meantime, just getting the kits up and running, um, and lot, lots of different activity. Uh, now, with the 3D printers, there's there's a whole package there, and that is, like, you've got the mini PVC, the 3D, or, or a regular mini version, because if you make nested frames, when you cut out a 4 by 8 foot steel in America, for the frames, you get 14, 16 inch, 14 inch, 12 inch frames, 12 inch and 10 inch frames could also be used, but they would be more D3D mini style. Uh, but that is important, so you can use use all the materials when we do CNC cutting from steel. And then of course with PVC, you can talk about 3D printed frames from plastic that would be workable. But that's, you know, each one of these things is a serious development. Uh, it comes together with the, the filament maker and, and plastic recycling to do different things. But I really want to see different different things coming off the production line, whether it's simple parts, clothing, bearing holders, rubber tracks, like, I mean, there's a lot of potential, but, but the fact is it takes a lot of development to develop any, any serious product, or like the cordless drill or anything like that. It's, it's major work on, on the development side. So uh, lots of work there. That's the basic, basic ecology of collaboration, adding the, the clubs, and I really look forward to this, this weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, when we get William. So that's William Neal, who is an early replicator. He actually built the brick press a long time ago with another person in China. So that's the infamous or, or famous China replication. He, he was behind that with an, some other people. Uh, but he has continued to work on OSC ever since. And he's, you know, he has posters of OSC in his classrooms at the London International Academy, which is secondary school. Um, but yeah, look forward to developing that relationship and getting out there. So we build the 3D printer on the first day and then, then do two days. One is uh, primarily about design and part libraries and the method for collaborative development on CAD. And then the last day, 
more about the how how to operate the clubs, how to uh, how to collaborate as a large team once many people are getting on board on the clubs, and then setting out some initial strategies like like how do we fundraise, how do we do the quarterly build events, how do we uh, invite others, and make this uh, work take off. So that's it on the that's a, that's a brief overview of OC clubs concept, but that is, a, I think, an exciting part uh, with stewards, people who are interested in, in different parts that can involve their students. That's definitely definitely a good way to go, so we'll see how that goes and take our lessons from that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's about it for today, then. We'll continue uh, same time, so 2 p.m. next week on, on Tuesday again. So thank you, everybody, and thanks for your contributions, and we will meet again next week. By that time, um, I'd like to be running the new D3D Extruder with a fan and a Titan Arrow so we can actually start producing some ever higher quality prints, uh, just getting into what we're doing right now is just really refining the quality to be able to print under all conditions and all materials, fast or slow printing, rubber materials, uh, large prints. So we've got all the, like the big printer, like one cubic meter, or the six foot tall one, that, that's all waiting. I mean, we're, uh, it kind of occurred to me that, yeah, I mean, we got to be producing that, not just talking about what producing the, the plastic lumber or other parts that are doable um, with the different 3D printers. So, and then, then again, moving on to other machines that use 3D printed parts, because after all, 3D printers are good for printing parts for other things. So it's that's why we're starting with that as a tangible, uh, uh, accessible route to involve more people as opposed to starting with tractors and houses uh, we take the start the OSE clubs with simple 3d printers that can get a lot of people involved okay so with that said uh, we'll take it again next week thank you guys